Welcome everybody to this session, which is addressing trust, media and global leadership. Uh, media plays a really important role uh, in this area and especially over recent years has experienced a, a big decline in trust, um, which is well researched and documented, but I am very privileged to have with us today, Mike Rann, who's a former Premier of South Australia and himself an ex-journalist and a former press secretary. And I'll, I'm going to leave you guys to introduce yourself a bit more thoroughly, but I'll just give a high level. And uh, Jerry White, who um, is actually a Nobel laureate uh, in uh, participation with uh, the Princess of Wales, Lady Diana, for his incredible work that he's done in the prevention or the, the making illegal of the use of landmines globally. Um, and also he's um, a professor um, at the University of Virginia. Do I have that right, Jerry? Yeah. <laughs> and, and also Catherine, who's uh, the vice president of the Press Club in Geneva, as well as an incredibly experienced journalist and my kind of gal who likes to get down in the trenches and report the real news as it is. Um, so I'm very privileged to have all of you join us. Maybe, uh, Mike, you can just start with two minutes to give a, a bit more of an intro to yourself and then we'll pass to Jerry. Okay, so you, I had um, 26 years in parliamentary politics in, in Australia and was for 10 years the Premier of South Australia. I was also Minister, same time of economic development and was the second uh, climate change minister in the world. And we um, really, uh, at one stage, a state with 8% of the population of Australia had about 60 plus percent of the investment in renewable energy. And uh, so it's an area that I'm still involved with. I'm on the US, UK and global boards of the climate group, um, which is uh, a not-for-profit. I'm also involved in lots of other kind of renewable climate type causes. And this goes back a long way because as I just mentioned uh, um, off air before I was involved in, very heavily involved in the New Zealand campaign against uh, French nuclear testing in the Pacific. Uh, this is many, many decades ago. And uh, I'm an ex-journalist, ex-political journalist. And then as, as mentioned before going into politics myself, I. Uh, was a press secretary to lots of different sort of premiers and worked on election campaigns for the Labour Party in New Zealand and Australia. Great. And Jerry? Yeah, so it's true. I, um, I'm a professor at the University of Virginia where I teach on religion, violence and strategy, how to stop killing in the name of God. So really it's about strategy when you pick very big issues that are, can't be quote unquote solved but you have to be creative in finding new ways to address or mitigate violence around the world. And the fastest growing type of violence happens to be religion related violence. But before that, for the last you know, couple decades, I've been a serial social entrepreneur and activist and humanitarian. I myself stepped on a landmine when I was 20 years old while camping in Israel. So that was my introduction to the landmine issue, not knowing that there were over 80 million landmines buried around the world at the time, but just thought it was a freak accident where I spent six months in a hospital um, in Tel Aviv. Uh, and now I work and walk with an artificial leg. So that was why I got into the landmine movement to ban it globally, working with, as Peter said, the Princess of Wales and many other illustrious people around the world. Um, so right now I'm based in Florida, St. Augustine, which is the oldest city in America. Nice. Thanks for coming today. Really appreciate that, Jerry. And Catherine, uh, maybe you can share a little bit about yourself as well. Yes, um, I mean, first of all, I feel the privilege to be with uh, people like Mike, Jerry, and you, Peta. Um, I feel I feel uh, very small toward the experience of the two gentlemen. <laughs> uh, but you never have to say that you're a former journalist because it's in your blood. So whatever happens in your life, you stay you stay a journalist. You know, you have that investigation. Uh, uh, sense, I would say. So um, myself, um, yes, I'm, I'm a, a reporter for uh, many, many years, more than 25 years. Uh, my specialty is coverage of conflicts in Africa and women. Um, and um, uh, I'm based now for the nearly 30 years um, in Geneva, Switzerland. I was based in Paris, in Montreal, in Africa, in the States. 
Um, and um, uh, I'm, as Peta mentioned it, I'm uh, vice president of the Swiss Press Club and uh, elected vice president of the Association of Correspondents uh, at UN in Geneva. Um, I fight for uh, access to information. I fight for uh, freedom of expression. And uh, usually when people see me around, they just hate me. <laughs> Not me. No. I don't hate you. <laughs> so a little bit about myself. I'm Peter Milan. I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Transcendent Media Capital. We're a venture studio that looks at whole systems change and how to incorporate media and technology together to solve complex global and systemic issues. Uh, we're providing a new model for capital investment for investors who want to see greater impact as well as financial returns. And I also uh, founded, uh, co-founded a technology company, JD Lai Technologies, uh, which has three offices around the world in, in Germany, Malta and Portugal, uh, where I'm privileged to live. I love living in this sunny country. And uh, I'm also Australian like Mike. So it's nice to have two Aussies at the table today. <laughs> Often we're underrepresented. <laughs> and uh, also um, I'm an Associate Fellow of the World Academy of Arts and Science. And um, I'm also on the International Advisory Board for the World Sustainable Development Forum. So like Mike, I also get heavily involved in climate issues, um, but I'm also very vested and active in a lot of social justice issues as well. So um, I was fortunate in 2012 to make my entrance into the world of Hollywood and start actually working in the entertainment industry. I had hoped to get some folks representing the entertainment industry to this panel, but unfortunately, uh, my colleagues whose integrity I absolutely trust, along with the members of the panel currently with me, um, I uh, wasn't able to get them in the time frame. So I'm going to try and represent the entertainment industry in this conversation. It's an important conversation because we have seen a, a big decline in the trust of media over time. This is supported by the Enderman Report 2019. Anybody can access it. It's free online if you want to look that up. I'll put the link into the chat a bit later. Um, they did a recent report for 2020 looking at the impact on, of COVID uh, on trust. And we've seen a gradual increase in trust in government since COVID happened. Um, but uh, the Enderman barometer measures against the perception of people across a range of countries based on competence or incompetence and ethical or non-ethical. And the uh, business were rated as competent, but not ethical. Uh, NGOs were rated as ethical but not competent and government and uh, media were rated as both incompetent and unethical. So there is clearly a trust issue. And so uh, that is what being well documented. Um, Oxford University also did another really interesting study, which I'll also post, which is about uh, looking at collusion in media uh, influences in media narratives and how that cre affects in this particular study migration, but it also affects, you know, all other perceptions of global issues or issues that we see are relevant or how they affect us in the world. So we don't want to have this panel go too deeply into the reasons for mistrust. We can touch on it, but what we do want to look at is have this be a working session where we can work to develop strategies for the restoration of trust. Um, so, We'll touch on this very lightly. Maybe if you can have a, a paragraph or two from each of you about what do you think based in your experience of global campaigns, media, news media, um, has led to the decline in trust by the public? Who wants to kick this off? Jerry, you're nodding, you can go. Or Mike, you're moving your mouth. Oh, Mike. <laughs> okay, so I guess, what I've seen, having been a, a journalist back in the 70s, um, what I, a number of things happened. One, I think, that was that you know, we've, we've now got a pack mentality that often emerges in the mainstream media. I'm talking about newspapers, which are in decline, rather than the sort of scoop mentality. Um, and so I, and also I think we've seen a number of other things where as media, uh, audiences and circulations have declined because of the rise of, of digital um, 
that what we're seeing is essentially at the same time that we've got this dilemma that the media have to, in order to try and attract attention, become even more sort of engaged in either the enrage, you know, how do we make people angry enough to watch or, or listen or read? And as a result of that, you can see why um, trust in the media has declined because ultimately it's in many circumstances, you've got brilliant journalists on the front line of wars and oppression and a range of other things. But at the same time, the other corollary of a free press is the sort of the trash media, uh, the, those that basically try to um, engender uh, not only outrage, but also to try and make sure that victims of crime become victims of media intrusion. And I think what we've seen here in Britain, and I'll talk about Australia later because it's no exemplar, is that when it got to an extreme uh, back in 2012 with terrible examples of people's homes, uh, phones being bugged and everything else, uh, people being hacked, uh, that what we saw was a, a, a Royal Commission, a public inquiry by Lord Leveson. That inquiry found the breakdown of culture, ethics, breaking the law, all of these things throughout the mainstream media, not everybody, but a whole range of major uh, News Limited and Mirror newspapers and so on, and came up with a recommendation. And that recommendation was to, to toughen up what is now called the Press Complaints Council and have a sort of a, an independent commission that could actually have punitive uh, damages and also demand uh, placement of apologies for outrageous breaches of, of, of ethics and law. And it was interesting that the government, it was celebrated the Leveson inquiry, uh, it applauded uh, what it had founded, the media did, a, including Rupert Murdoch, did this mayor culpa, and then the government decided, the Conservative government, that it would not, however, implement the uh, recommendations. And so I think the failure of journalists, the failure of the media to come up with some kind of self-regulatory um, approach to professionalism, unlike doctors, lawyers, and architects, has become the architect of its downfall, or part of the architect of its downfall. Mm. Catherine, earlier in our conversations, you were talking about the impact of funding as well on, uh, on what types of stories actually go to air and what types of, also in the entertainment industry, it applies what types of films get made uh, that shape our perceptions of reality. Um, and what do you think? Because I think that this is also a very valid point about who drives the funding for these types of things as to what types of narratives get validated and pushed out to communities. Can you say something about that? Yes, um, I would say that it's very interesting um, to see, in fact, the evolution of this kind of um, situation. Um, when I started journalism, I mean, we had tendency uh, to see that in uh, the Western countries, uh, you had a, a great uh, opportunity of freedom, access to information and choice of stories. Uh, you had real meetings uh, uh, of the boards, the editorial boards in the, in the morning and a group of people were uh, sincerely and um, on a very transparent way deciding uh, which would be the stories uh, put on air or, or printed in, in the newspaper. And um, in, in the rest of the world, developing countries had more the tendency to have new p newspapers or media that were belonging to the, the state or belonging to political parties and called media. But behind that, you had the funding because you had professional journalists, but that decided to work for a certain newspaper, usually, or radio, uh, because they had the financial capacity to pay them a salary. And of course, they were delivering what was expected from them. And I have to say that through the years, um, but particularly, I would say the last seven or 10 years, I mean, that kind of a model is now the one that you see in the Western countries, is that uh, media now um, are belonging uh, more and more to political parties, or if not, they have hidden agendas, so they, they're belonging to, they're more and more politicized, I would say, and of course, the journalists uh, reporters that are working for them 
are delivering what is wanted. And usually it is stories that goes, of course, supports the ideas, the political ideas uh, of the owner or the, the, the political party that is supported by uh, the, the media. And this is very annoying for, for, for press because in fact, first of all, you have kind of self-censorship. So you decide not to propose a story uh, because you know in advance that it might be refused. So you, you do that. Or the other hand, if you have, I would say the courage uh, to propose uh, something new, innovative, I mean, it's refused and then you start to, uh, to be pointed as um, someone that, you can, that cannot be trusted <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in, I would say, in the, the environment of, of the media. And um, also we can talk about that's the funding, that's the salaries. And um, at the end of the day, it is also like you mentioned, uh, the fact that more and more stories are thought as being able to be um, not only have an effect, a direct impact on the public, on the people, the watchers, the readers, and then can be used also for other purposes, like um, make a movie. We've, we've, we've seen that more and more successful uh, Hollywood movies are based on true stories. Yeah, correct. And that leads me to Jerry, because really, when you were working on the campaign with the Princess of Wales around banning landmines, that was really arguably, in my opinion, one of the first really global yeah. successful campaigns, right? And that was happening at the precipice of where globalization was only coming into awareness for the everyday person. Perhaps there were things behind the scenes like monetary systems that were already globalized. But in terms of the perception of globalization, you were really in the early early stages of that and you ran a hugely successful campaign that ended up resulting in in a significant le legislative but social impact as well so can you tell me about your experience of that and what you've seen change over time because media does have the power to either really affect things for good or in the opposite polarize and disenfranchise and disempower vulnerable people so maybe you can share your thoughts on that no, great. I think it's important to think of the what I would call the nonprofit or the NGO industrial complex and are the way we have formed coalitions over time and also the use of information and the use of media and news to advocate for a position. So the role of many activists and advocates is not actually to maybe tell the whole truth or to make an issue complex but to communicate according to the lowest common denominator, just something that you know, anyone can get if you're trying to reach the masses. So as you said, Peter, in the 1990s, when the campaign to ban landmines was being birthed, um, there was limited information about the extent of landmines around the world. There was a few studies. So it starts, this is a man-made epidemic, the proliferation of anti-personnel mines around the world. And we're starting to see cases showing up all around the world. That the statistics we used were also very simple and not quite accurate. But let's say if they were 80% accurate in the early stage of a man-made epidemic, just like we're seeing with COVID-19, that still is information to deepen and to uh, pay attention to. So for example, here's some of the early talking points we had for the international campaign. There are over 100 million landmines buried in over 100 countries around the world. So that's easy to remember, right? It turns out that that's not exactly correct because then they later did studies and it might be more like 60 to 80 million landmines in up to 80 countries. So it's still a humanitarian crisis. It's still like a global epidemic that we've created of military litter that's blowing up people. So then later on, we may have nuanced a little more just to get activists or students or anyone to be able to grasp the complexity of the landmine issue. So you'd say, if you remember the number 80, you can be an expert on landmines. You know, that you'd say up, there are up to 80 million landmines buried in over 80 countries, and 80% of the victims are actually civilians, not soldiers. So that's something that people can grasp. It's, you know, quantitatively relatively true. You're trying to communicate. So this isn't the same as journalism or the same as education and facts and understanding. So one has to learn and discern with your ear when working with passionistas, you know, passionate advocates around the world, they will select 
information that is accurate and helpful for the cause, in our case, of banning landmines, that these were not helping soldiers. And so the other, we had a qualitative saying too that would shock people to say, did you know that landmines have killed more people than nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons combined? Also a fact, but it sort of wakes people up. Like all those people who have been killed throughout the years, every 22 minutes was another um, saying we had that someone would be blown up by landmines. So this combination of incremental knowledge of a pandemic, incremental knowledge of the disasters caused by landmines and other weapons like cluster munitions is something that changes over time. So I can see that we try to make it simple for activists and people were mobilizing, even busy politicians and leaders. But sometimes I must admit that that advocacy and the passion that goes with it isn't nonpartisan. And so one has to understand what is being activated for. But the 1990s was the emergence of landmines um, as a huge issue, the emergence of Princess Diana using a celebrity authentically to champion a cause. Now what's happened today is there's so much information on the internet. There's so many different advocates on the same issues. And there's so many celebrities, you know, sort of getting on Instagram and beefing up their numbers that you start to still confusing um, and very complex to figure out how to navigate information in the world today. Right. And we're, and we're seeing a new phenomena where more children are getting active and using media platforms to advocate for their important causes with the likes of Greta Thunberg. And I know Dr. Pachari has set up the POP movement, which is a platform for young uh, people to be able to get active on the environmental causes that are important to them. But interestingly, because of this decline of media trusted media, and we're talking like CNN and we're talking The New Yorker, we're talking Fox News, who've all in their own way become kind of polarized, increasingly polarized. Um, then we're looking at uh, and, and are being referred to either leftist or rightist in their views. Uh, we're seeing then also uh, grown adults vilifying uh, folks who try to speak out, even if they're kids, like Greta Thunberg, uh, whether her science is completely right or not, or or whether you know the way in which she presents is is amenable to certain people or not, is is irrespective. But we're seeing this kind of decline in trust of what's being put out there, and then that having that impact also on those activist approaches to working with media to transform social or environmental issues. What do you think has led to that particular decline, Jerry? I think part of it is, I mean, you see here in Florida, where I just moved a couple of years ago, you know, and as the U.S. has become more polarized and partisan and people um, are undermining sort of information and media. So I was told when I went into like certain restaurants or bars, I was like, why are they always just showing sports? And they said that they absolutely couldn't be like showing politics because this is a, a place where people have a lot of guns. They have high hot heads on politics. You don't know if someone's red or blue. So you just completely absolve yourself of actually staying informed or watching news and learning how to have what I would call news literacy or media literacy. So it's on one hand, it's that they people throw up their hands. It's like, oh, the media, it's all just a bunch of nonsense. I don't follow it. So they absolve themselves of citizen responsibility or civic responsibility, I believe. The same thing with politics. It's just too complex. It's just like, I, I, they're all corrupt. So when you loop a lump all media into the same bucket or all politicians as corrupt in the same bucket, it's no wonder that that's had the effect of minimizing the trust in like very important you know, institutions of democracy. So we can't, I now sort of try to call people out and say, well, it's our responsibility not only to vote, but to be informed. Where do you get your information? And like you mm -hmm. said earlier, with more and more youth growing up with, you know, 90% of them using, you know, internet or the social media, uh, there's some statistics I just saw right here from Common Sense Media saying 90% of teens use it pre and preteens on social media. 76% of them are getting their news there. 44% of teens and preteens believe they know the difference between fake and real news, but that's only 44% believe they know the difference. Mm -hmm. And 31% of teens and preteens say that they have shared information that they later learned was false and inaccurate. So how does one circle back on that? How does one discern you know, truth in media and in politics and looking for authentic channelers of communication? Yeah, absolutely. Hence why I've you know, ask the people that are currently on this panel to participate because I absolutely trust your integrity and it's, it's, it's increasingly hard to find.
in media and politics, right? So in order to have conversations, which we're moving to now on strategies, like given this increasing noise, given the advancements of social media, given the increasing polarization of trusted media sources and the decline in trust overall, what are the strategies that we can employ or explore to actually take place in the industry to restore trust? What do you think, you know, if there were like one or two big ticket items that needed to somehow transform, what would they be for you? Mike? One of the things, oh, maybe oh, if sorry, I could... Catherine? Oh, no, you yeah. go ahead, Catherine. No, you, you go ahead. No, 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 no. I mean, I, I just wanted to mention what uh, Jerry, uh, make a comment about what Jerry uh, said and about his personal experience. The problem is that uh, and and uh, it's true when you started, when you did organize all that with Princess Diana, that was a first, that was a premiere. But this has been uh, duplicated 1,000 million times. And now, uh, because uh, don't forget that I'm particularly um, covering uh, the work of uh, the United Nations and uh, the UN agencies. I mean, um, the tendency is that you all, they all need a goodwill ambassador and it has to be someone prestigious and it has to be someone from Hollywood, you know? And um, uh, the, the first one that started, I, I think about 15 years ago uh, to, to use um, a football player uh, to advocate, uh, it was UNDP. Um, and uh, UNDP did use a, 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 a football player to uh, attract the attention of the public and the funders, because at the beginning, it was the goal. The goal was to attract the attention of donors to get money in order for the programs to be funded. But after it started to be like um, a, a Hollywood gala, you know, you have uh, all kinds of stars, um, not only the ones that are worldwide known, um, uh, to come back to Mainz, Yunmas, uh, the, the, the agency in charge of mines of the U UN uh, uh, is um, using the image of Daniel Craig, James Bond, uh, to, to advocate. I mean, Angeli Jolie, Angelina Jolie is very active for many, many years at UNHCR in charge of refugees. She, when she was pregnant, she even went to Haiti and you had the press uh, um, with her. And I think that maybe uh, between reality and um, um, the movies, people are not making the difference anymore. What is real, uh, what is, I wouldn't say fake, no, what is um, put on screen. And that is maybe also why you see so many young people standing up to defend uh, issues. Uh, because they think that uh, adults are uh, living in another world, like in a bubble, you know? And um, I think it is very difficult to restore trust, but if you, you trust is still a very big into humanity um, and, and, and into young people, I think it's possible. And you've seen that the COVID-19 crisis, in fact, helped out because it showed that it's possible to decrease pollution. It shows that it's possible to uh, consume less. It's, it showed that it's possible to have uh, meetings like this one without all of us uh, taking uh, a series of planes and flying uh, all over the world. It is possible. It is true that uh, human relations are uh, necessary to build trust because if I know you personally, I will trust you and I would trust the infos that you're handling but it's also the reason why um, I think um, information should lean on real journalists, real reporters that are respecting ethics. Because as a reporter, you are respecting ethics. You make the difference between the facts and an, an opinion. And now it's today, it's like a cocktail. And it's very difficult for people to make the difference uh, between uh, what's fake and, and what's real. Right. Mike, what I, were you I totally say? agree with Catherine. I mean, one of the things that I guess I saw during all those years was the blurring. We used to have news stories and opinion. I mean, don't forget I come from a country where 70% of the newspapers plus Sky News are owned, uh, is owned by Rupert Murdoch. And I think that's very unhealthy for a, a democracy, particularly when they love to have front page stories about 
poor people being welfare cheats, but uh, you don't often see it about uh, uh, rich corporations that don't pay tax in Australia getting huge handouts and so on. So, so I guess one of the things that, you know, I was on my way to Mexico where Peter and I were at that conference and I was in Dallas for one night, turned on the television and watched, kept flicking backwards between CNN and Fox News and you might as well have been in a totally different universe. I was disappointed that CNN, which I would probably naturally favour, had four commentators on out of four who were all at the same time having a go at Trump. Uh, and I would have thought it, it could have been a bit more balanced. Then I turned over to Fox and saw, I mean, it was just like something out of nowhere. So ultimately, if we're going to fix trust for journalists, which this conference is about, what is journalism about? It's about telling the truth. It's actually about telling the truth, te testing arguments, sorting out fact from fiction. And so, you know, if on issues like climate change, we shouldn't be frightened of the truth because the truth is, is one way. You know, you've got tens of thousands now of the world's top scientists who, uh, the science councils of so many countries, yet in Australia, when I had, you know, we've now in my state, more than 50% of our power is renewable. We were having all of this massive investment in renewables, in wind and solar. And what happened is that we decided and announced we're going to have this experiment by putting tiny wind towers on the tops of, of government buildings and to see if it would work in capturing the wind tunnel effect. It was like it cost nothing compared to the billions being invested and that we said it was an experiment and the experiment failed. Suddenly the front page of the News Limited papers was, you know, wind power failure. And of course people reading it would have thought it was the billions that, have, and then it was always allusions to this amount of money that was being spent. But in fact, none of it was government money uh, in terms of the big investments. It was the private sector because climate is, um, because renewable energy is now totally bankable. So ultimately, we've got to basically say it's about do, telling the truth and it's about testing opinions. And that's the only way we're ever going to get rebuild trust um, in the media because otherwise it's a downward spiral of the kind that that uh, you know, judge's report pointed to here in, in Britain. And of course, they all behave for a while and now they're back at it. And you know, if you've got, if you're the Prime Minister of Britain and you're a Tory, you wake up every day knowing that you've got automatically the Daily Mail, the Sun, you've got the Daily Express, and a whole series of other newspapers operating like Pravda in supposedly the, you know, the, the mother of democracies. And so I guess my message when I talk to journalists, I got sick and tired as a politician, having people phone me up and saying, oh, by the way, I want to apologise for today's front page. Uh, the, the first eight pars weren't written by me. That was someone upstairs. But if you read the rest of it from paragraph nine onwards, that was, sorry, if you read the rest of it from paragraph nine onwards, it was a good story because it told the truth. So I think that... But it's the first you know, eight paragraphs that set the context for yeah, the interpretation yeah, of the story. <laughs> was, the, was the headline, was the massive headline, which is what people are going to, to, to read. So... Ultimately, it's about journalism. So, how do, so, so then what you're alluding to here, Mike, which is an important point, is then uh, what we were discussing with Catherine is somehow the funding structures need to change, right? Because it's the yeah. financiers and the, and the influencers in terms of senior editors or people who are approving the content uh, that are determining how the narrative flows or looks or works or what's picked up and what's not picked up. And, you there know, from... Yeah, there are some encouraging signs. I mean, Twitter in the last week is now fact-checking people's statements. It's removed 30,000 accounts, which are fake news accounts from China and elsewhere. Um, they're fact-checking Donald Trump, which must, must involve quite a number of staff, I would have thought. And, uh, and of course, it's driven him crazy. Um, and then what... But, but, so I think that's good. I think what the other thing that encourages me is that during the bushfires of Australia, during the pandemic here in Britain and elsewhere, that people are always turned to public broadcasters, the BBC, 
CBC in Canada, um, the ABC, Australian Broadcasting Corporation, which are absolutely, you know, in my view, exemplars. They make mistakes, but they're exemplars of those fundamental journalistic values. And you know, we're lucky in Australia, we've got two networks, SBS, which is multicultural broadcasting and the ABC. And I'm really pleased that when, you know, when the chips are down, when things go wrong, when there's a crisis, that people are shifting away from tabloid television, the channel nines and sevens and 10, and returning home to something they trust. So if journalists tell the truth, then trust in the media will be rebuilt. Otherwise, it's a downward spiral to, to basically like the National Enquirer, where JFK meets Marilyn for a tryst on the moon. And I just like smooth past that and won't talk about the fact that my dad's worked for Channel 9 for the past 40 years, Mike. <laughs> but but we'll, we'll move on to, you know, Jerry's comments about that because, you know, if one, one thing that I wanted to say was that in working on the investment side of things, what we recognise with investor funding is that they want to always go into the technology or they always or it always wants to go into the things that feel more tangible yet ignores media investment and ignores um, the fact that basically if you do media ethically if you do media well you can actually you know help shift perception in such a way that you align more with the truth that you align more with uh, important social justice or human humanity based issues or environmental issues that are kind of good for everyone yet that type of transition often gets positive posited as being socialist in its view and uh uh, guys who are spouting opinion as fact uh, are hiding behind this kind of constitutional right, right in the US as freedom of expression, uh, seeming to be expecting impunity from whether their expression causes harm or not. Um, so I think that there needs to be a reconsidering of um, of capital and the use of capital uh, for media. Uh, in a way to ensure that the demand for ethical media is there. What do, what do you think about that, Jerry? Because your work was, I imagine, very, very heavily reliant upon donors and, um, you know, contributions from people who had access to wealth to help drive your campaign. Um, what, what else do you see are really strategic requirements that require transformation as we face it now. You, you, touched, you touched on some of it, Peter, in terms of looking in the education and the media tech space and more investment there. Um, I think we, what I saw, let's hit an example, when I served in the US government for three years as a political appointee under President Obama, I was at the State Department and I was immediately struck that how powerful one felt with so much information, so much knowledge at your fingertips. So we have 16 intelligence agencies. You could, you know, have factoids all day long. And, you, and I realized that all of that, under, all of that knowledge base and all the information coming at you about conflict around the world didn't bring understanding or discernment to see the patterns and therefore, and didn't have wisdom or values based underneath it. So just being obese with information, which we're becoming, is not necessarily healthy, like eating gummy bears all day long with this information coming from Intel. So we started to realize that the couple things that we analyzed, one was that um, the two things that people mistake as true that we have to understand the difference between like what's real news, what's facts, what's truth, what's journalism, what's opinion, what's media, and, you know, not lump it all together. But I saw on one hand we had Intel, and then on the other hand you have pundits or subject matter experts who we sometimes trust or don't trust from academia or from the news. And the pundits are also notoriously wrong in, mis in, in mischaracterizing and, and predicting the future. So you realize that individuals, subject matter experts have their biases. So they're good for vertical information that's sort of siloed in what they know. But whenever they're asked to predict the future, they most of the time get it wrong. It's just sort of, a, you know, from the you know, best pundits that we may know or, 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 or name on television or in newsprint. So you have artificial intelligence on the other side with so much big data coming your way that I called it sort of pig data. There was just like, what are you supposed to do with all of it? It, it gets more and more uh, minuscule and accurate, but less correct in making good predictions for the future. So all of us have to understand between, there, there's a whole spectrum of source material we have to learn to navigate. 
And that includes not throwing away big data and artificial intelligence, but understanding when you're being manipulated and not throwing away thoughtful analytical you know, pundits, but understand that we need more. And that brings me to my final point is more investment in ed tech. When I was creating a, a company that was to help with pre decision analytics for policy and issues around the world, I found it very interesting. Two things that people said, oh, ed tech, it's so boring and long term. And so it really isn't a sexy investment. So I found that I had to like suddenly call it media tech or they, if you called it fintech or some other type of tech, you're more likely to be in the bandwidth of you know, venture capitalists and their interests. So this longer slog of improving our educational system through learning technology that will be helpful in news literacy, I think that's a challenge ahead. It's not a quick fix. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of our listeners has written in about uh, talking about the relationship between citizens' rights to information and more broadly the right to freedom of expression and the obstacles faced by media in implementing or giving concrete expression to these rights. Um, this takes us, uh, Umesh's uh, comment here, and thank you for that, Umesh, is, is talking about that there is sufficient evidence to demonstrate that media does play a role in the polarization and marginalization of vulnerable people and minority groups, right? We see that uh, mm -hmm. in the types of narratives that were driven anti-immigrant sentiment that uh, arguably some would say led to the decision to vote on Brexit. Uh, definitely what we've seen in the US under the current administration, uh, uh, Islamophobia and uh, also um, um, South American people or indigenous people. And we see problems with, you know, definitely perceptions of indigenous people in Australia and, and in Canada and over the world. And these current race, concerns that are really coming to the fore in, in a renewed, uh, powerful way. Uh, and, and I won't go on because there's so many examples with the, you know, the LGBTQ communities and, and so forth. What strategies could we develop to prevent harm and improve social equity? Because media does have a part to play. If they can pull apart at the fabric of social equity in the way that often they do, they must also have a, a possibility or an opportunity to actually heal that and, and enable social equity to exist. I know it's a complex question, but what are your thoughts on, on this uh, type of subject? Because obviously this is important for trust. Oh, the silence is deafening. <laughs> I'll, I'll mention just quickly, um, you know, when we work with people with disabilities um, on the campaign to develop the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, it was always so interesting how media didn't portray people with disabilities for like, you know, centuries or decades, and then how it was sort of a charitable thing to show like raise money off of poor people missing limbs and eyes and whatnot around the world. So there was this, uh, what worked for fundraising was depiction of victimhood and yeah. sale, telling of the victim story. Um, when we came in with the landmine and the disability crowd, we started to realize that part of learning for everyone was radical inclusion. Until you knew someone in a wheelchair or someone with like limb loss or et cetera, et cetera, and started to hear about the importance of you know, person first language, you might still be saying invalid, cripple, handicap, and not paying attention that linguistics are evolving over time and the perception of victim to perceptions of survivors. But that can also go in the opposite direction that everyone with a, is inspiring who's like missing arms and legs and eyes because they have disability. That's not true either. So again, getting at this sort of center point of balance in our understanding, but the media has a very important role to play in how they depict issues in people with disabilities, for sure. And that means all these workplaces, including media, have to have radical inclusion. Who are they hiring? Do you know people with disabilities? Do you know transgender people? Do you, have you spoken to people? So any issue that you're talking about a marginalized or group or quote, the poor, the Jews, the blacks, the Americans, with that generalized stereotyping, that has to be jumped on really quickly. And who will jump on it? People of those marginalized groups who are saying red flag, watch your language about us and your depiction. That accountability comes from inclusion in the workforce, and, and in diversity the media, education and, yeah. yeah relationships with real people yeah and it's really true what you say because a friend of mine who was the former chief marketing officer for time they time does this incredible stuff where they run uh opportunities every year for um to work with an ngo 
uh, and to contribute skills and funding to that NGO. And they had an incredible uh, campaign that they were put, but it goes in front of the whole company. The whole company gets to choose, which is fantastic. But they had this great program because Time does a lot of artistic stuff as well to use their art talent to work with people who are more vulnerable people, homeless people or recovering addicts or whatever to help them give a, get a profession and get on their feet and these kinds of things. But of course, you know, when the NGO comes in that has kids who are sick and dying of cancer, which is also a very big need, but much more tragic in, in, the, in the view of the people who are watching the film, um, then that gets the money, that gets the vote. Do you know what I mean? So you're completely accurate. I can even see that in the context of the business world when choosing who to align with in, in terms of their CSR or their SDG goals, um, that whoever is the biggest victim or portrayal of victimhood or is perceived as the most in need uh, wins the funding, right? And we need to somehow provide a better, bigger platform for more social equity and, and more accurate portrayal of, of of, of, uh, I, turn the, I turn the question back to you all as well, because I'm just watching, I'm noting in media, whether the New York Times, Washington Post, or The Guardian seem to do it first, this morphing of media businesses into nonprofits and their fundraising and their taglines and advertising, asking for contributions to support truth in media, for example. So these for-profit businesses turning into nonprofit fundraisers have turned them as a nonprofit or in, in competition with the Non the, the NGOs or the educational space. So that, I don't know when that exactly started to happen or if you all have a comment on newspapers as fundraisers, not just subscribing businesses. My only comment was really on the former point about, you know, when I talked earlier about diversity of ownership of media, but also diversity of reporters, presenters, and editorials. So it goes to your point about people with disabilities. I mean. I was last night, I actually, because I knew I was coming on today, I looked at uh, various of the networks. I was incredibly impressed here in Britain, particularly with the BBC, at the range of accents from all around the country, from reporters, uh, the range of uh, ethnicities, and, uh, and also the range of ages of journalists and reporters. Because you know, when I was back in Australia last December, just for, for Christmas, I looked on the comm three commercial channels and everybody looked the same. The announcers were, all looked like they were about 30 and all looked like supermodels and, uh, and sort of micro thin. Uh, the journalists all, you know, all had essentially the same kinds of, of accents. So the only way, you know, you need someone in a newsroom to say, hey guys, uh, Think about this. And so diversity of reporters, the diversity of editors is absolutely critically important if we're going to actually, you know, shake out of all of this. Yeah. And to back to your point, Jerry, I think the emergence of newspapers as donors in that sense has come about with the demand from the grand populace of private sector starting to have some kind of social conscience or some kind of environmental social responsibility we see with the, all the development of the ESG indexes and things like this it's now expected from the consumer that the company not only generates profits for its shareholders but it can demonstrate some kind of good that it's doing now unfortunately a lot of the good that it's doing is still based on self-report so we don't really know whether it's actually doing that kind of good or not but it's actually being kind of greenwashed a lot uh, as a marketing tactic which is where kind of corporate social responsibility has lost a little bit of its credibility because it's seen as a marketing tool more than an impact tool a lot of the time but you're seeing more of these uh private sector organizations jumping on to support uh, a particular cause or something that they think uh, either they're interested in genuinely or that is going to promote and, and uh, their brand uh, and separate them from the competition. And Imesh is just talking about, you know, accountability of media, as we just talked about, who would be responsible, civil society. Like, I don't think it's a binary question. I think that one of the powers of civil society and why media has an important role to play in that is because we as consumers, we as individuals can call it out. We can say, you know, we're not going to buy your paper if you keep feeding us this BS. 
you know, we're not going to buy your product if we know that you're having little kids picking cocoa beans in Ecuador. You know, we as consumers, we as, as civil society can shape the demand, which is why we can also call it out for media as well and put pressure on those financiers to start driving truth into their, into their content. Uh, because as consumers, they need us. We're the ones who have the power as the consumer. If we're not buying what they're selling, then they have no business, right? So I think, you know, what you talk to, I think, Mike, about having like a framework of ethical governance, like some uh, uh, psychologists have or accountants have or, or whatever, the media profession, I agree, there needs to be some regulatory framework as well, um, which needs to uh, our next topic, and I'm going to end it after this topic, so we might have some more time for Q&A, is talking about, you know, is there a new benchmark of ethics that needs to be established in media to restore trust? And if so, what could this look like? Yes, Catherine. I just wanted to come back on what Mike said, and that, that, that would match your question too. I think that also that uh, there, there is a tendency to get rid of the people that have a certain age and that have an expertise and that have an education and that are respecting guidelines and respecting ethics. Because when you have a meeting and you have diversity and you can confront diversity about like you just give the example of kids working, uh, the, uh, labor linked to, to children and things like that. If around the table you have young adults that are usually more models, like you, you said, uh, models than, than um, in fact uh, journalists, reporters that love their work because also in that job you need passion and you're not counting your hours and these people um, I don't want to criticize globally all the young uh, journalists but we have tendency to see young people that as we said are good looking and have absolutely no uh, single knowledge uh, about what's happening in the world and it doesn't interest them I mean they just want to be on air and I recall the story, I won't mention the, the TV channel, that when uh, uh, the, 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 um, um, the conflict in Yemen started and I, I said, I had the anchor woman on the phone before the, the news uh, and I said, uh, listen, this is the question you have to ask me. And, and she, she, she very, uh, very nicely said, but what is Yemen? Is it something new? I don't know. And I, I nearly collapsed and I said, but honey, I mean, this is a country. <laughs> Are you aware? And after I complained to the chief editor and I said, listen, I, I understand that young people can't know everything, but at least uh, that she knows, you know, geography, that she knows the countries. And he, he, the answer was, oh, she's coming from uh, the, the, the business. I mean, I mean, you know, when you, you see things like that, you cannot rely on the goodwill of such people because in fact, they're not fit for the job. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not fit for the job because they're not passionate. They're not, um, if, if we, I mean, our generation uh, folds in order to have an article in uh, printed or a story to be on air to defend the content. I mean, uh, that is also, because when you have a certain age, you're not scared about your, your boss. You, you just say, okay, let's sit and, 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 and have a chat. I will give I just you would like to add, add one thing to that though, Kath, because there are a lot of young people coming out who are really forming themselves, who are really taking yes. that responsibility on to arm themselves with information. And young. likewise, yes, but likewise, I've seen older people who are reporting where I'm like, oh my God, what century has this person come from? Because they're perpetuating really like uh, storylines that are anti-equality and, and anti-good uh, <laughs> basically and, and coming from a really ignorant you know, perspective that maybe in the 1950s would have been relevant, but not now. I'm seeing Donato online. Hi, Donato. Are you contributing to this now or...? I was taking a nap, but now I realize that <laughs> your camera's here and I'm seeing you. So I'm like, are you joining at the last minute for a piece of wisdom? And in the meantime, you called me. So what can I say? Uh, I didn't call you. 
uh, you are in wonderful company. The all of you, so I'm very happy for, for you. Uh, and I heard the last exchanges. So let me say one word. I, I heard it from Catherine and for you, Peter, respect. I think it's fundamental. It's fundamental in this profession. It's fundamental in all professions. But uh, as uh, a witness more than an actor these days, but I've been an actor also in the in, in the media, uh, not business, but in, in media in general, <laughs> because uh, I've been a reporter. I'm still a reporter in many ways, but I've been, uh, uh, m m you know, more, more involved with the United Nations as, uh, uh, as uh, you know, in charge of media affairs, etc., and as a spokesperson. I think that the level of aggressiveness that that we see these days in media in general is impossible. I mean, really, uh, this, I mean, I, we heard from Jerry, uh, ethical standards, it's very, fu it's fundamental. But uh, what I see nowadays is really the level of intolerance. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it's uh, unheard of. I mean, it's really something that I find offensive. The fact that you see whether they're young or old is, is a really an intergenerational problem. Fact that you have uh, uh, hosts that express themselves with such terms and with such uh, push, you know, and such drive to affirm their own truth without listening and without stating facts, because that's basically what media is all about, stating yeah. facts, and then you should have the, the judgment after. But in, now everything is mixed. Everything is, you know, comes on top of one, on one another, people coming on top of one another. So there is no time, there is no way to express a thought. And more offensive, I find, is the fact that these anchors or these uh, uh, co conductors, I don't know how to describe them anymore, you know, they, again, affirm their truth and they are offended if anybody else has a different opinion from them. This is really... Yes. Ta taking a personal offense to an intellectual discussion is interesting. <laughs> interact and say, well, I think like you, maybe I don't think like you. And this is your prerogative, it's our prerogative. So this is the main point that for me has to be really reinstated in, in, in journalism, in media. That is the respect. So the word is respect uh, and tolerance and understanding. Yes. And I also agree. I heard about what you said among victims. Uh, you know, I, I being in in uh, in in war situations, in conflicts, Western Yugoslavia and, and many other places, uh, uh, in former Yugoslavia, many other places, uh, um, in my career, I can tell you that uh, in wars, in conflicts, there is this factor of playing the victim. You know, it's really something that happens at, at all levels. Uh, everybody tries to play the victim, and the media fall in this trap over and over again. I mean, because it's so easy. <laughs> it's so easy to see the first victim that comes in and say, well, you know, I'm the victim, so I need support. But no one, nobody that, you know, because it's a commercial factor, it's easy to sell if you see uh, someone on top of a tree uh, that is asking for, for food, etc., and say, well, this is a victim. Of course it's a victim, but let's see the full story. Give time to the audience to understand what is the full story. Over yeah, I, okay. I just want to tread lightly on that topic, Denial. So because be awake at the same time. <laughs> okay, great. I just want to tread lightly on that topic, Denial. So because often in the press we do represent perpetrators more than we represent other people affected by violent crime. So I, I'm a big supporter of a valid voice for the victim in order to actually articulate their experiences because mainstream media always looks at the perpetrator, the perpetrator's family, what's the perpetrator's background, and then the people who are affected by the perpetrator kind of get lost. And so, but I agree with Jerry that there is a way to portray it and present it that's empowering for the person, uh, not to use victim victimhood as a manipulation tool in order to gain funding and, and these types of things, but rather as an empowering device for people who are genuinely affected. I just want to end it there because we have three minutes left and I'd just like to hand it over to some more questions. Um, Ganesh, 
Gananash, uh, I don't know if I'm saying your name right, uh, writes that diversity is a possibility in developed countries, but what about countries that don't have uh, wealth and prosperity or access to diversity? I think it's a really interesting topic. I, I have personal experience with that, so I'll just respond to it. And it's, um, you know, the use of technology now, even in countries where internet can be a bit spotty, we have cool things available like Skype classrooms, for instance, where you can connect kids in the UK with kids in Nigeria or with kids in Russia or with kids in the Middle East so that you can start building relationships between the children and having lessons uh, to talk, have the kids talk to each other about their culture and their history and their background. We're seeing that in some really innovative schools in Wales where the communities were ex-mining communities and now are pretty impoverished. All white communities don't have access to being able to travel, don't have access to diversity and they're using technology and I think this comes back to Jerry's comment on, on good ed tech and having proper investment in that will also allow for this type of training as well as media content. We're developing a TV show, which is an empathy based TV show for young kids ages six to nine, which is all about teaching education through diversity. All the characters are diverse. Um, so I think there needs to be more there is a movement towards that. We're seeing the BBC now trying to create the woke wombles. I don't know if you remember the wombles from the 70s and 80s, but I watched it as a kid. Uh, but they are, um, they're trying to make them woke now. I don't know how woke they're going to be, but there is a move towards empathy-based entertainment, which I think is an important factor here, which also needs as much funding, I think, as, uh, as ed tech itself. So that brings us to a close. I'm being kind of cut off. I just want to take the time to really thank you, Jerry and Mike and Catherine uh, for you. your time. Uh, your insights were really powerful and I've written everything down, uh, you know, that we've kind of mind mapped in a way as possible strategic ideas, which I'll pass on to the UN as, as part of this. Um, so any final comments before departing? I'm not on the board of this group, but I would just share the resource of uh, the Literacy Project and their, their online virtual classroom called Checkology. So it's a new way of teaching students with, and it's being measured with high impact. So if I left, you know, check it out, the News Literacy Project um, based in New York. Um, it's right. having some great success as one example. There are many. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Mike, Catherine. I just go uh -huh. back to it. It all comes back to the truth. And I also agree with Donato's point about respect. It also, for journalists, has got to involve self-respect because if they don't seek the truth, then they're not journalists. And uh, so I just get back, just always say, but what is the truth? Isn't that what journalism is supposed to be about? Yeah, thank you. And Catherine? I would say invest in good reporting. And if you invest in good reporting, you'll get, you know, a very positive uh, res re result. Okay, great. Thank you so much, my friends, for your time. I appreciate you joining this panel. We're one minute over, so I'm going to leave it here so that uh, the Academy can kick on with the next session. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.